How we doing today, church? Man, it's an exciting day to gather as the church and to worship our great God. Amen. Anybody excited to be here? Cool. If you're not uh, by the end, I hope you will be, man. Uh, welcome home. I want to welcome those that are joining us live online and those that are joining us in our coffee venue. And I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. Today we're kicking off a new teaching series. You see it right here. For the one. For the one. That's the, the next four weeks. We're going to be talking about this idea of what does it look like to intentionally reach that one person that God has placed in your life. And, and so for the one. And as we, uh, as we, as we look at this idea, uh, we're going to be looking at four different parables uh, in the New Testament in Luke chapter 14 and Luke chapter 15 that Jesus uh, taught. Jesus taught with a lot of parables. If you read through the Gospels, you'll see that. Uh, Parables are little stories with a big idea. Little stories with a big idea. And he taught with parables. He taught with stories to help people understand what he's talking about in reference to the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God looks like. He taught with the stories to just to, to kind of break it down. And, uh, and I don't know about you, but man, I love a good story. We, uh, stories help me understand. Uh, I'm not the uh, brightest crayon in the box. And, uh, and so stories help, help something come alive for me. And so today we're going to be looking at the parable, the story of the, uh, the great feast. The parable, the story of the great feast. And so before we dive into the text here in Luke chapter uh, 14, I want to just ask a question, kind of get you thinking just for, just for a moment. Uh, what is the best meal you've ever eaten? Just think about that for a moment, not, not to get you hungry. Like my stomach is growling right now, uh, a little hungry, uh, but it's a little too early for lunch, you know, but, but, but still think about it. What's the best meal you've ever eaten and what's the best party you've ever attended? You, you think about that just for a minute. As you're thinking, I'm going to share the best party we've ever attended uh, and, and we talk about it uh, often. It, it was our wedding day. It was the reception at our wedding day. It was fun. It was nuts. It was crazy. Uh, uh, and people were dancing, laughing, and there was, of course, food, and, uh, and, and there were whistles blowing, and all sorts of things were happening. It was a party, man. It was a party. And uh, as we look at the kingdom of God, one of the things that we, we often miss is that the kingdom of God is a party, Uh, We should be one of the most celebratory organizations in the world. Why do I say that? It's because we have something of significance, of eternal value. We have something to celebrate. And so today we're looking at this this idea here that Jesus' kingdom is a party. And so I want to invite you again, if you're not already there, turn to to Luke chapter 14 with me. And we're going to look at uh, verse 15. Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. Are you there? Here we go. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. And so you get this visual. Don't miss this visual. I want you to make sure you're with me on this, right? Uh, They're they're at this table. This guy turns to Jesus and he says, hey, it's going to be an awesome party in heaven one day, isn't it going to be? Being a part of the kingdom, it's, it's a celebration, isn't it? And so to answer the question, Jesus answers with a story with the parable. And I love that about Jesus. He just kind of breaks it down for, for folks like me and, uh, and, and, and for, hey, let's, 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 let's give a big round of applause. I was tending to something uh, in, in the hallway. I completely missed the, the, the celebration, man, but I'm excited to watch it back. We celebrate with you, my sister, in the faith, and, uh, and I just love the value of discovery, uh, how, our, how we value the next generation and what God is doing in the lives of our student and, and children's ministry. That's something to get excited about. Raising up the next generation to lead uh, one day, and, and I think we should get a little more excited. Uh, again, because of this idea today that Jesus' kingdom is, is a party. Man, it's going to be an eternal party. Uh, some of you need to get those hands ready. Some of you need to get, the, you know, uh, get, get, get a little excited because for, the, for all eternity, man, we're going to be partying with our Savior. What a day it's going to be. Man, what a glorious day. Uh, in response to, to the question in verse 15, 
oftentimes people think that the kingdom of God is just, uh, and, and all eternity of worship is just one long, boring church service. Right? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, you can be honest. You can be honest. Uh, okay, good. Nobody's, nobody thought about that. Uh, and that's probably a good thing. If you've been a part of Discovery for any time, you, you kind of get that it's not going to be anything like that. It's going to be a very celebratory. And, uh, and, and so uh, this, 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 the kingdom of God is all about a party. Jesus' kingdom is, is a party. So let's look at Jesus' response in verse 16 and 17. Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. What we see from verses 16 and 17 is that Jesus' kingdom party is an open invitation. You've ever created a, an event on Facebook and you have the option of private or public, right? And, and a lot of times you go private. Uh, uh, Jesus', is, Jesus invitation is public, right? It's public. And, uh, and so just, just, uh, just, just kind of the set, the, the tone, and, and, and once again, he shares the story about how a man has, uh, has prepared, the host has prepared his home. Everything's ready. You think about the last party, and some of you don't want to think about it, you know, okay, you're like, oh, thank God it's over, right? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of cleanup. But you think about the, the, the highlights of the party, shall we? Think about the highlights of the party, the good things of the party. I mean, I mean, you, you, you changed out all the smelly things throughout the house, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 you know, you baked something fresh, you, you, you cleaned, you know, your, your annual cleaning, you know, you did all these things, and, uh, and, and you're ready for a party. You're ready to host people. And that's, that's what Jesus begins with, with the story. And then once, the, once everything's ready, he sends out the servant to go tell the guests, hey, come on, the banquet's ready. Come on, the party is ready. Jesus' kingdom party is an open invitation. Salvation, listen, salvation is available because God has made it possible through Jesus Christ. That's, that is a, that's something to celebrate. Man, that's something to be thankful for. That our hope is secured because of what Jesus Christ has done. He paid the price over 2,000 years ago, and he didn't stay on a cross, and he didn't stay in a grave, but he rose victorious so that we could be set free. We just sang about that a moment ago. And that's, that's the essence of what we're singing in that song. We've been set free because of Jesus Christ. All humanity has been invited to the party. Don't miss this in the story. All humanity has been invited to the party. The beauty of the gospel is that salvation is for all people. Everybody say all people, all people. Man, sal salvation is for all people. Therefore, all people have been invited to the party. All people are welcome in this church because this church is a part of the kingdom of God. Tell the person next to you, you're invited to the party. Tell that person that you're invited to the party. You know, I was thinking about this, this text and the open invitation. And as I was thinking about the open invitation, that Jesus' kingdom party is an open invitation, I couldn't help but think about diversity. And each week, most weeks, I have the honor to, to stand before you today, sit before you, maybe a little combo of both. And look out and see a diversity that you perhaps do, don't get to see. And, I, and one of my prayers is that Discovery Church would be not only a welcoming church, but that we would be a church that stands beside one another. And the only way we can do that is by engaging each other, building community, having fellowship. And, and that's why we set up a coffee venue in high tops outside. And, and that's why we do all of these things so that you can get to know people. And that's why we have discovery groups spread out throughout St. Lucie County so you can get to know people. But as I look out, I see a diversity. And I believe that the diversity is one of, of the church's greatest strengths. And if it were up to you, let me just be honest for a moment. If it were up to you, you wouldn't seek out. We don't naturally, most of us don't naturally seek the diversity. We want to stay with what we know. You've, you've ever heard, I, I can't go there because it's just one big click. Yeah, you ever heard of that? I mean, maybe that kept you from coming and, and I just want to kind of break through that and, and we will not tolerate that here at Discovery Church. Why is that? Because it's an open invitation. The gospel is an open invitation. Salvation has been made available for, for all people. 
We're going to celebrate that diversity here at Discovery Church. And, and so again, if it were up to you, you, you naturally would, would, would stay with people that, that are like you, that sound like you. That, that, uh, that, that you, you have those common hobbies that even maybe smell like you. And, and so, so, so if it were up to you, that's, that's where you would be. And, and, and as you look around, what you see within Discovery Church is indeed a, a diversity. You see, people, you see people, all kinds of different people. You see business owners and maybe you don't, even, you don't even know. And then you see people without jobs that are just struggling. You, peop- you see people that, that, li- that live in the avenues of Fort Pierce all the way to the gated communities of St. Lucie West. It's the diversity. There's a diversity among us. See all kinds of vocations all around this room, all kinds of vocations. And we celebrate that. We celebrate that because this is Jesus' church. And he wants to take each of us and use us where he's placed us for the sake of the gospel to make Jesus known, that's why you are where you are. And maybe some of you have just been wondering, why? Why am I still flipping burgers at this place? It's because Jesus has placed you there. Some of you are wondering why I'm a nurse and why am I at the same hospital? I'm tired of working with those people. And it's because Jesus has placed you there. No matter where you're at, stop asking why and just start asking Jesus, use me. Use me. And then when you're ready to use me somewhere else, God, close this door and open the new one. And he will. See, some of us just need a little uh, a perspective change today. And I pray that you allow God to do that. Jesus' kingdom is a party. It's an open invitation. And who's the one that God has placed in your life right now that you need to invite into this party? Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18 in, uh, through 20. So the servant goes out. He tells all the guests the, the banquet is ready. Come, the banquet is ready. Verse 18. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. 19. Another said, I, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and, and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I, so I can't come. Uh, there, there's, there's all these excuses Jesus shares with those that are listening that day. And, and, and how many times do we allow our, our excuses to get in the way to getting a little closer to Jesus and to, to, to living out the gospel of Jesus? At, at one time or another, we all have. So I'll be the first to admit, there, there's, there's lame excuses in my life that get in the way. And that's what we see in this story. The banquet table's ready Man, this party is ready for people. It just needs people. So the servant goes out and begins inviting all these people. And, and, and all the responses, one after another, is I'm too busy. Okay, just, pa- just pause. I think about it this week as I was looking at this text. And Have you ever hosted a party like this? You've put the time in. You put the time in. I mean, you, you do all the work that it takes. You have more than enough food. You, you go out and get the decorations. Everything is set. And no one shows up. Or maybe one or two show up. What does that feel like? You think about that. What, what, what is looking towards an exciting event be, quickly becomes not so exciting. And that's what Jesus is sharing here. That there's one excuse after another that's hindering people from experiencing the kingdom party. As we take one step further, we're talking a lot about heaven, but can I just say that the party starts, that doesn't just start in heaven. I believe the party starts here on earth. And why do I say that? Because Matthew chapter 6, right, Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray. Have you read the, the Lord's Prayer? And in and, and verse 10, specifically, Jesus says, May your kingdom come soon. May, may your will be done on, on where? On earth as it is in heaven. I, I, so again, the party doesn't just start here in heaven. Or doesn't start in heaven. It, it starts here on earth. Don't miss that. Uh, that's why some of the churches I visit, I, I wonder, am I at a funeral or am I at a church worship experience? Like a lot of times, man, it is funeral. 
And it's because I believe we, we've missed it. The party starts right here, right now. I just wonder, what, what's your picture of heaven like? Just think about that for a moment. What's your picture of heaven like? Revelation chapter 21 is, is a familiar text. And maybe you've attended a funeral that's the scripture's been read or you've attended a, a church and the scripture's been preached. But I just want to take us just for a moment to verse 4 and 8 to paint a, to paint a picture of what heaven's going to be like. Look at verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. That's what we have to look forward to in heaven. What a glorious day that's going to be uh, in, in, in heaven one day. No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. Look at verse 6. And he, he also said, it is finished. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He says, I'm the first and the last. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious, verse 7, will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God, and they will be my, my children. We just sang about that a moment ago, the sons and the daughters. That we're sons and daughters of creator God. He's, he's father God. He's the only one, by the way, that, that name is reserved for him. In one day, in heaven, what a glorious day it's going to be. What a beautiful day it's going to be. What a, what a celebration. Man, what a celebration it's going to be in heaven one day. And so my thought, and we even talked about this in Huddle, my, my thought, what, what, I, what I often try is make sure that, that I'm just not, that, that I'm preparing for that party. And I believe that's what we do here when we gather as the church. We, we're, we're preparing for that party. Man, we're preparing for the eternal party. Some of them are just, I'll just, when I get there, it's going to be a game on. No, no, let's start right now. Let's start right now. Let's not miss and waste this time on earth. You're here for a reason. God has a reason and a purpose for your life. Some of you are missing the purpose in your life. God wants to use you. He doesn't waste anything or anyone. He wants to take you and use you for the advancement of his kingdom. For the gospel's sake. Look at verse 8. We just painted the, the picture of heaven, and, and now verse 8 paints the picture of, of hell. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. This is the reality. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And one day, depending on your relationship with Jesus or lack of a relationship with Jesus, depending on your surrender to Jesus as Lord or your rejection of Jesus as Lord, we will all stand before a holy God. And just because your parents were good people or Christians or pastors like mine, none of that matters None of that matters because there was a point in my life that I surrendered over to the Lordship of Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I need you. There's no way I'm getting into heaven on my own. I will never be good enough. I need the perfect sacrifice, your perfect sacrifice, to provide the forgiveness that is needed. This parable was the last sermon that a famous preacher his name is D.L. Moody. It was the last sermon that he ever preached in 1899. And before the speaking engagement, he told his students at the Moody Bible Institute, before he left to Kansas City, he said, he said this, don't, don't miss this, never, never have I wanted so much to lead men and women to Christ as I do this time. And so he left. 
And, and, and as Moody stands up, as Moody stands up to preach, what, what, what he didn't know was his final message, by the way. He, he stands up to preach, and he can barely, he can barely stand. He, he, he reaches out and holds the organ. There's a throbbing pain in his chest, and he proclaims the gospel of Jesus, and 50 people surrender their lives over to Jesus that day. The next day, he left to, to travel back to Chicago, and then one month later, he died. What would it look like, church? What would it look like if we had that same yearning, that same burning passion for the one person that, that the Lord has placed in our life? What would it look like if we, if we looked at D.L. Moody as an example of a gospel minister? And can I just tell you today, you don't have to be a pastor to tell people the gospel of Jesus. Man, that's good news for a lot of people in here. That's a relief for a lot of people in here. You just have to be intentional to say, Lord, you've given me this day. Use me today. I surrender. I want the same passion and the same yearning within me. You only have to be a servant of the master who is saying this, come, the banquet is ready. Look at verses 21 through 24. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still, don't miss this, there is still room for more. Verse 23. So his master said, go out into the country lanes uh, and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. I'm going to invite a friend of mine to, to, to join me at the table just for a minute here. I'm going to invite Mr. John Gizzy. Would you put your hands together and invite my, 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 my friend John Gizzy to the, to the table here today. John, welcome. Welcome to the table, my brother. <laughs> Love this guy. I appreciate his heart, his passion. And John, would you just share with the, with the church just for a moment, just kind of share your, your story, your coming to faith story. Would you just share with the church? Sure. Um, so my name is John. Um, I, I'm 32. I'll be 33 in, uh, in June. He's single, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, Continue. So I grew up, I grew up, uh, I grew up uh, pretty, pretty privileged. I grew up um, with the same mother and same father, oldest of uh, five. Uh, we all grew up together. My parents uh, brought me to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, put me in, you know, Christian school, you know, uh, through elementary school. Um, and... You know, I, I heard the word growing up. Mm. I was taught it. I sat. I, sometimes I had to sit and, you know, when I acted up in children's church, I sat in, uh, I sat in big church with my dad. And so I was hearing it. And, uh, you know, I was a rebellious kid. And my whole life, that's just how I was. Um, uh, after high school, you know, I, I, I got involved in things I shouldn't have gotten involved with. You know, I, I got real far from God. Um, not because I didn't know any better, but because that was just a choice that I made. Mm. Um, so... It wasn't until I was about 29 years old that I was driving, and I just and I was going to church at this time, um, but I just I just I just felt like a real burning in my heart. You know, I felt like the Lord's telling me you're going to hell. I'm like, no, man, I, I go to church. You know, I'm going to church Sunday. I, you know, I'm good. And uh, it was just it was overwhelming. I, I was scared. Um, I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And I felt the Lord tell me go go to church. I was like, all right. So I went to the first church that was. I looked around, and it was the first church close to me, so I was driving through the parking lot, and uh, it was a church that I went to as a child, and I drove around the parking lot five or six times, and I didn't know what to do, and I was just asking God, what do I do, what do I do? And, uh, and my old pastor comes, you know, comes out of the office, and he sees me in the parking lot, and he's like, hey, brother, you know, uh, why don't you come, why don't you come visit us on Sunday? I was like, sure thing. I had no intention on going to church Sunday there. Uh, I lied, but <clears throat> that Sunday, I just... I was woken up like 4.30 in the morning, which was weird. I tried going back to sleep, and it was like, you know, you're going to church. I'm like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> nah, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I was like, all right, I'm up. So I went to church, and uh, I was in church. Uh, I met, I, was, I sat in the back. Um, I sat in the back. I don't want to disturb anybody, you know, because uh, I, I knew I was full of it. Uh, so I'm sitting in the back, and, you know, and I got there on time, and this young dude came in a little late, 
to his wife. He's like 25. His name was Carter Cox. I'll never forget. Good friend of mine, man. Um, so he, uh, he sat next to me, and, and the pastor's, all right, uh, greet your neighbor. You know, tell him you love him. And I, I saw the dude checking me out. He's like looking at me the whole time. He kept looking at me. And I was like, oh, man, this dude's going to try to talk to me. So I'm like, <laughs> you know, like a, a skinny jean wear. And like, yeah. So, so I'm sitting. So I just kind of just, you know, like lean a little bit. And uh, so he's like, all right, uh, greet your neighbor. The music plays. And he, boom, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm Carter, bro. He's just super, like, obnoxiously friendly. Um, <laughs> So I was like, all right. I was like, what's up, man? How's it going? I was just I was trying to be polite. And he's like, hey, I want you to come to this. I want you to come to this, uh, this evangelism training class we're having. I was like, ah, sure thing, man. Absolutely. I had no intention on going. So <clears throat> I wasn't going to go. It was, it was the following week. Uh, it was that Saturday, 4.30 in the morning. Boom, up. I was like, why am I up? You know, I was like, oh, I got to go to that thing today. I was like, I'm not going to that. I'm like, you're going. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going back to sleep. He's like, you're going. <laughs> I was, like, I was like fighting God at this point. I was like, you know what? I'll go. So I went. So I went and we did this training class. And, and one of the things that they were teaching us uh, was in uh, John 4. He was teaching us about how Jesus met this woman at this well. And she was, she didn't have any friends. Uh, she was a, the sin, they call it the story of the sinful woman. She, uh, she had a bunch of husbands. She, like, she didn't have any friends. She was by herself. And, and Jesus told her, go. And, uh, and tell your husband, she's like, I don't have a husband. He's like, that's right, you were, you were honest with me. He's like, the man you're living with is not your husband. Go and tell him anyway. She brought the whole village back to see Jesus. And it says after that that the whole village, you know, was saved that day. <laughs> and then yeah, he yeah. stayed, and that even more, you know. And, and we went out. He's like, okay, now we're going to go out. We're going we're gonna to go share the gospel. So we went out. And I was like, oh, man, I, said, I don't know what to do. But he told me the story. I was like, listen, if that lady could do it, you know, I've been hearing this all my life. I could right. do this. So we went and. Every door we went to, you know, I was like, please, God, please, God, don't let anybody answer the door. And <laughs> so we did like four or five houses, and I started feeling bad about it. And so, so we went, and, and finally I was like, all right, I'll do it. So we knocked on the door, and I was with actually my old pastor at the time, and the people answered the door. He's like, hey, how you doing? You know, I'm Pastor so-and-so, and my friend John wants to tell you something. <laughs> Just turn me to the wolves. So I shared, I shared the gospel using the three circles. Um, that's how I was taught that day. I wasn't even a Christian yet. I wasn't walking with the Lord, you know. I mean, I got baptized when I was seven, but that, you know, I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. You know, I, I, I struggled, you know, my whole life, just emptiness, lostness, you know. I, you know, I, I struggled with addiction for a while. I tried chasing happiness through money or I even tried getting famous. I did stand-up comedy for a while, and it just, it wasn't, it wasn't getting me anywhere. I just was still, there was that emptiness inside of me, and... So that day I felt really good. I was like, boom, I could, I could do this. And, and then sur- church service was the next day. And on the way home from church, I was going over the bridge. And I just like, right there, I just broke down. And mm. I just, I was like, I surrender. I yeah. give up. You know, what do you want me to do? I didn't pray like, like a, the, the prayer that they gave at the end of the service. Or I didn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a big deal. I was just like, I, I give up. What do you want? What's next? What do you want me to do? And I didn't get an answer right away. And I just kept, I kept asking him, what next? What next? Tell me what to do next. I want to I wanna obey. And I got a phone call from Carter. And he goes, hey, uh, why don't you come with me? Uh, come for coffee. I was like, all right. So I met him for coffee. And I told him what happened. He was super excited. Um, and, he, and he started walking me through um, scripture. Hmm. And I had a lot of questions. I didn't know. There was a lot of stuff I didn't know because I heard that story before. But I always thought that story about the woman was just, oh, wow, Jesus was a nice guy. He hung out with, like, you know, <laughs> you know trashy people, uh, which he does because, like, I'm trashy people, you know. It's, and, and I didn't realize that the story was that Jesus commands us, and that was the one thing that I learned right. most of all. Jesus commands us to go and make disciples. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is that why you would say you are passionate about sharing the gospel? Is it because of that commandment or anything else? That's just, anything one, of else That's just one of the reasons, man. I mean, I mean, Jesus tells us also, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And as myself, I have a real big thing about self-preservation. Like, I, I'm cautious. I don't want to get hit by a car. I don't, I don't want to go to hell. You know, anybody want to go to hell? Certainly not me. Uh, you know, so if I love my neighbor as myself, I don't want to see them in hell either. And I've seen so many of my friends and family yeah. over the last 33 years die yeah. that didn't know Jesus. My yeah. cousin passed away 25 years old. Uh, from a drug overdose, I knew the word. Yeah. I knew the truth. Yeah. And I, ne- I wasn't living it, and I certainly wasn't sharing yeah. it. And now, most likely, according to Scripture, my cousin's in hell right now because I was not walking in obedience with the Lord. 
And out of, out of all that, that that I learned, and the reason why I'm so passionate about, about sharing the gospel and obeying Jesus is because that's all. It doesn't cost anything to do that. Yeah. It's so easy. All you have to do, I mean, parents in here, you can say, what do you, what do you want for your birthday? What do you want for Christmas? I just want you to obey. Just listen. You know, God just wants us to listen. He just wants us to obey. Yep. Jesus tells us, if you love me, you'll, you'll obey yeah. what I commanded you to do. Yeah. And he commands us to love each other, yeah. and he commands us to make this up. Well, and I love this verse. You, you see it, I, and we just read it. You know, there's still room for more. Do you see how that connects with what, with what John is saying, the passion in his heart? There's still room for more. And so the question for all of us, not just because we're on the platform, but the question for all of us today is, is who are you inviting to the party? And so what we've done is we've created, uh, we've created this, this prayer guide, this 30-day prayer guide. And I hope that you receive one. If you didn't receive one, uh, there are, our home team is going to be in the back as we close the worship experience. And they love to give you one of these. Uh, and so it, it just, it's a simple guide with scripture and with prayer and a blank. Write that person's name in the blank. I, um, and uh, it's just we, we spent a lot of time this week, right, uh, putting these things together, printing these things uh, for us as the church so that we could be intentional this month of inviting people into the party. The last thought as we close, the last thought there in verse 24, we see that there's an urgency that we should live with. Did, did, you, did, you, did you read? I read it kind of quick. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. And you heard, you heard John in his heart as he's sharing about uh, uh, his cousin. You know, you, you heard his heart here. And, and we see that, that there's a, an urgency. Why is that? Why should we live with an urgency? It's because hell is real. But the good news is this. Heaven is available. Because Jesus has paid the price for our sin debt. There's not one perfect person in this place today. We all deserve one thing, and that's hell. That's separation from God for all eternity. But the gospel is so good. The gospel is so good because our God is so good. That he loved us so much that he sent his one and only son over 2,000 years ago to be crucified in my place, in John's place, in your place for your friend's place and your family member's place and all humanity so that if we will call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. Would you bow your heads? Would you, would you close your eyes just for a moment? Would you bow your heads and just close your eyes all across this room? All across this room, would you just think about that? I just want you to ask God, what is my response today? What is my response today? Maybe, maybe you're here, you don't, you don't know quite why you're here. But, but I pray that right now in this moment that it would be made known and evident why you're here today. I'm going to ask, if you're a follower of Jesus, would you just pray right where you're at? And would you just ask God, God, would you, would you put a burning passion inside of me? Put a, put a burning passion inside of me for someone that doesn't know you. And if, maybe, maybe you're not a follower of Jesus today. Maybe you're not a follower of Jesus today. Today would be the day that you surrender your life over to Jesus. Today would be that day. All across this room. If that's your heart's desire, you're saying, Tim, if I were to die right now, I don't know where I would spend eternity. Would you just have the courage just to lift your hand? I'm going to pray with you. Man, I see this, this, this one right here. Anyone else, you would have the courage back here, right over here. Would you just have the courage? And, and over here, you just have the courage, man. Uh, Tim, if I were to die today, I don't know where I would spend eternity, but I want to leave with a confidence and assurance. I want to place my faith and trust in Jesus. Anyone else, that would be your heart's desire today. That would be your heart's desire today. Right where you're sitting. Right where you're sitting, all across this room. Would you just call upon the name of the Lord with me? Would you just call upon the name of the Lord? Right now, dear Jesus, would you say that with me, dear Jesus? I know that I'm a sinner. And I need you today. I need you today to save me, to set me free, to forgive me. I believe that Jesus paid the price. And I'm placing all of my faith and all of my hope in you, Jesus. 
If that's your prayer right now, would you just say, thank you, Jesus. Would you say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for setting me free. Would you just celebrate that? Could we as the church just celebrate those that made decisions to follow Jesus today and how good Jesus is? Lord, we, we come before you as we close out this worship experience. We thank you for how good you are. Lord, those that made decisions to follow you today, Lord, I pray that they would take next steps of faith, next steps growing in you, loving you. Lord, they would be committed to you. No more excuses, Lord. They would be committed to you. Lord, I pray that we as your church would be a committed people, a fully devoted people, fully devoted followers of Jesus. And so, Lord, we praise you. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray.